For any number of buyers, he had visited on his travels. The carpets were threadbare, the walls lined with photographs of rugby players, burly men with crumpled ears, vacant grins, and hairstyles that never seemed to go out of fashion in these parts. He was big Jimmy Traxman, who once ran all the way from his own 22 with a broken foot bone, and the Rudeval slotted four drop kicks in a single game, including one reflected off the jaw of an incoming defender. Men of grip and courage were killed and abused, turning from the puzzle, turning from the plaque, Turning from the black to the puzzle head slacker leaning over the counter to take his order. So, what's it going to be, Whipped? What it is on tap, said Hill, that's sitting on the bar stool. And please don't call me Whipped. The barman shrugged. Gil would help himself with some peanuts and then sat, sat back to drink in the ambiance of the place. The back wall was a mosaic of coins and business cards. A broad dangled from the ceiling, as did a vintage wooden peg leg. The former owner of the bra was not in evidence tonight, nor was the person who stumped on the phrase graced that leather pouch. Apart from Gilbert, there were only other, two other patrons, not counting the trio of musicians setting up on a small stage. The howlers, their name emblazoned on a banner strung up between two sets of springboard horns, seemed an unlikely trio. One was bearded and blubbery, the second sleek and thin-wristed, like an ebony curio trucking from the north. The third, the third had a bonus quality about him, and eyes as grey as a flintlock. Gilbert watched the bearded guy fit a violin to his chin and wiggle it around until it made a little nest for itself. The thin-limbed muser was wiping down his T-bone, while the third howler, he of the flintlock eyes, was tuning his guitar. He stopped when he saw Gilbert looking in his direction. Where were all the barflies tonight? Gilbert wondered his gaze moving through the deserted room. Where were the pool players who should be throwing the table back there, or the dartboard kings who in the opposite corner should be home? Live music might not be their thing, but it shouldn't be keeping them away either. He narrowed his eyes, recalling the flyer that had blown up against his booth on the tarmac outside, the edgy font and the mouth emitting concentric arcs of sound, the howlers. Could it be that their promo had propelled rather than attracted? It was only he, as an outsider, impervious to the bad vibes they were sending out into the world? Or might there be a different explanation? Might Providence have constructed this evening around him alone? He wiggled his feet on the foot rail. Sometimes at bar counts across the great river, an odd feeling had come over him, a sense of mastery. The feeling that he could control his surroundings as easily as he could control things from the bike behind the wheels of his, the wheel of his fall. Traffic's eye, traffic signs, cat's eyes, the orientation of hills. How were they different to mood lights, jukeboxes, or long? He pointed at the foot rail, but with no great conviction. For tonight didn't really feel like one of those nights. Everything from the ashtrays to the dartboard to the cube of chalk on the edge of the pool table was too self-contained. For a while he sat pondering that chalk. He pondered his drink too, and the perfect stillness of the ashtrays. Then he took a sip and gave himself over to other musings. He was swimming with the fish in Charlie Becker's stack, one more speck amidst those brilliant flakes of glass. He followed the jumbo molly and the woman she was named for. He pursued the skittish black and yellow, black and yellow fish through soft stemmed plants and streaks of bubbles. Who might she be a proxy for? Then he was diving deeper, recalling his ex-girlfriend, quality inspector at the depot, and how she once ate half a box of Turkish delight before he could finish telling her about the moonlight playing over her face when the field. He remembered their first clumsy wrestle under the palm trees of a Sheva reservoir. He remember, remembered her smile and her eyelids, and how astounded she was the day he tried to tell her about the fish. On he swam, back to the days of his childhood, back to his room and its walk by the crowded with tiger moths. He saw them massing in the dark while his mum and dad had it out in the kitchen. A triangle of light swept across the ceiling as his mother came into his room to sit on the edge of the bed and reach for his hand. He closed his eyes as though it were possible to block out the bleakest scene of all, a rush of bubbles, his mother's, mother's body surfacing in a world of light surface. The scraping of a chair brought him back to the present. The other two patrons were getting ready to leave. 
As the door closed behind them, uh, behind them Gilbert swung around to the barman and directed his attention to the houses in turn. Thus far, the band had produced only with a few experimental twangs. Listen, Rory, the barman said, glancing at the empty tables. It is Rory, right? I'm sorry, but we'll have to face the possibility that this is going to be it tonight. It is sometimes not so busy on a Tuesday night. Right, said Rory, tightening his grip on his violin. Let's get started then. He nodded to his bandmates before picking up his mic and carrying it to the edge of the stage. The barman muted the TV and flipped on the stage lighting, such as it was. Ladies and gentlemen, Rory began, looking into the lights as if to drown out the emptiness before him. Allow me to introduce the Howlers, three of the most dedicated musicians ever to step out of Sonder Bard of Penitentiary. Here he paused, when the hum of the bar fridge became audible. Gilbert slapped on the counter to show his support. The barman made his cash register chime, though this might have been accidental for he didn't really appreciate it at all. Right, and we're just as excited to be here. It gives me great pleasure to introduce, to my left, on guitar, Big Frank von Sale, and to my right, on trumpet, Zolini, Sweet Bird, Baloi, while I'm, of course, Rory Berg, with Big R, my fan. The Howler's music wasn't easy to categorize. Partly rock and roll, partly folk, and partly unlike anything Gilbert had ever heard. It was instrumental, this much he knew, as long as one ignored Rory's atmospheric mutterings. But even to his untrained ears, the instruments didn't seem to have harmonized particularly well. But perhaps harmony wasn't what the house were after, which might also account for their technique. They played with such exaggerated movements that they reminded him of wearing kitchen appliances. The sound wasn't all that dissimilar either, except when the violin was dominant. Then it resembled the sounds of a flippy mask and coat from a sword, sitting outside the depot with the grip between his knees and the blade fixed, flexing as four full strains that set the neighborhood's dogs barking. Gilbert looked at the barman. The barman looked at Gilbert. The pub was as empty as ever, but the howlers no longer seemed to care. Rory was playing with such fervor that Gilbert could easily imagine smoke rising from the strings. So Lily slapped his fire to the beat. It seemed that in all the excitement, niceties like finger positions no longer mattered. The music was growing richer, but also light for a foot. Loose change, jangling in a pocket. And when it ended, it was like one of those coins twirled into a pool. An idea also visually expressed by Frank dropping to his knees, his guitar above his head as he drew out the last agonizing strain. servants of two masters. We have to serve the original work, we have to serve the author, and we have to serve the target language or the reader or audience uh, in the target language. And that's quite a juggling act at certain points. And in drama, I think that the, the choices we have to make as we figure out how do I best serve the original here, how do I serve the impact in the translated language best. Um, it's complicated when you're translating theater because in fact uh, a play, a script, is like a score, a musical score, because it's going to be played by instruments. It's not a finished piece that someone can pick up and put 